Let's dive right in. Um, so today we're going to talk about how surfaces and different kinds of surfaces affect surface energy and how we can uh, kind of use those differences in surface energy to make different shapes of nanoparticles <laughs> and how those different energies govern the formation of nanoparticles, particularly with a gold nano rod. Um, so we have a homework that's due Monday. I'll get you another one either, um, I don't know, Monday or Tuesday of next week and we'll have it be due after Thanksgiving. And then I guess we'll do a homework nine. Um, I haven't quite figured that out. Um, remember that I'll drop the lowest two homework scores if I can get 90% participation in the course evaluations. I just discovered rate my professor too. <laughs> Dr. Lapomi has all of these chili peppers. Look how many chili peppers. But I don't have any chili peppers on ratemyprof.com. In fact, my ratemyprof.com is pretty abysmal. So, um, and I think I can give Dr. Lapomi a run for his money. So um, if there's anything you guys want to do over there, I will gladly take it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about surface energy. Um, so this was some of the conclusions from last time. Surfaces always come at an energetic cost, right? And that just kind of makes sense because we go, we're going from atoms that are bound to each other to atoms that are on their own, right? And so they're no longer sharing electrons. These electrons are, they're either have too many or not enough electrons, right? And so they're inherently less stable and less, um, and therefore more energetic, right? Um, systems will tend towards stabilizing high energy surfaces, meaning that it's more likely for two high energy surfaces to want to come together, right? And this is the bane of my existence as a nano engineer, right? Half of all of what I do is trying to prevent nanoparticles, if they're in a tube like this, from going a chunk of stuff in the bottom, right? This is what, this is what I'm always fighting with, whether it's, they're made out of gold or whether they're made out of silica or whether they're made out of copper sulfide. This is a perennial problem, right? this aggregation of nanoparticles into a chunk of stuff at the bottom of the tube, right? And this makes sense why this is particularly an, an issue with these, th with uh, nanoparticles is because they have so many high surface areas because relative to like a bulk piece of gold, a bulk piece of silica, they just have a lot more surface area. So those are much more energetically, um, th those are higher energy surfaces. So they want to stabilize with each other. Right? So that's why you've probably seen this kind of thing where they put polyethylene glycol or some other, maybe they put like a, a shell of another kind of material on top of your nanoparticle. Right? A lot of what that comes down to is trying to passivate the high energy surface, right? Copper, your quantum dots that you've seen before generally, right? They're cadmium sulfide core or cadmium selenide core. And then a zinc sulfide coat. What that is generally doing is a couple things. One is trying to increase the quantum confinement of the cadmium sulfide, but it's passivating that high energy surface of the cadmium selenide core, okay? Um, and then, yes, this is just another definition from Andrea Tao, where the surface energy is energy required to break bonds that hold a material together. The surface energy, or if it's a liquid, the surface tension. Okay? Um, so how can we be a little more quantitative? Um, so the total energy of a surface <coughs> Um, ES is um, one half, okay, where this is the 
number of bonds broken and this is the energy of one bond. Right? So that should be, that's pretty intuitive, right? Number of, amount of energy times the number of bonds. The one half just is of course because we're going from a, a, a surface like that. We're making two, two surfaces, right? So that's why we have this one half is because half of this energy is in side A and half of it is in side B, okay? Um, so let's see. We can also think about this in terms of a molar quantity. Um, so binding this E sub B, binding energy for one mole of atoms is <coughs> okay so here our EB is the same that's the energy I'll just write same it's the energy of one bond NA is Avogadro's number and Z is the coordination number. How many of you did not take the crystallography class? I know I did several exemptions. Almost everybody. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so then this makes sense again that here this is our molar quantity. This is the considering that each atom is bound to a variety of different number of atoms, right? So what's our coordination number for um, body-centered cubic? Is eight, yep. And for face-centered cubic? Uh, it's 12, right? Yeah. And for a simple cubic, is six, right? So these are important things to have committed to memory. Okay. So when are we going to have a high surface, a high surface system? So when will this go up? Or you can th think about it, when will this go up? Well, whenever you have a lot of bonds broken, or a high energy bond to begin with, right? Or when you have a very coordinated system. So for the exact same system of, for example, FCC versus simple cubic, it's gonna be a higher energy system for FCC versus simple cubic because your coordination number has increased if you cleave that bond, yeah. So for those of us who didn't take crystallography, um, oh, you didn't raise your hand. Oh, well, I'm not saying that. I didn't. Oh, okay. For those of us who oh, okay. Uh, don't remember that, the numbers <laughs> there associate with how many individual nuclei we see within a crystal. How many? Space. Yeah, this is um, how many neighbors it has, okay. right? How many neighbors it has? And that's why the name of this lecture was. So we're we're gonna. We're going to build on this and think about as we cleave these different planes, how many nearest neighbors does a, does a plane have and how many broken bonds does it have? And so those are kind of, those should add up to this number. Yeah. So in context of that, what do you mean by average number? Uh, oh, that's Avogadro's number. Oh, Avogadro. Avogadro's number. Yeah. Yep, good old Avogadro's number. Okay, so then we can, so the most of this then we can just kind of know intuitively except for this guy, the energy of the bond. And that's gonna be a function of, um, again, fortunately something that we can look up. 
the enthalpy of solvation. So, I'm, I'm sorry, sublimation. Enthalpy of sublimation. Um, where, again, this is Avogadro's number. Coordination and enthalpy. So this is something that you can always look up. This is a known, and this is something that you will know, right? So this is how then we can calculate this, um, the bond energy, okay? And this makes sense, right, that Z is down here. If we have more bonds, we're dividing each bond strength by a, a different number, right? So if our coordination number is 12, then the, the energy of each bond is gonna be lower as opposed to if it was six, right? Each bond would be more, would be stronger um, if there were fewer coordination sites, right? Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so, yeah. Does that mean that there's a direct relationship between the energy of the bond and the <coughs> binding energy of one mole of atoms? I mean, if you plug that in, it's a function of each kind of coordination system and so we're gonna we're gonna get there but yeah so what you'll eventually get and this is in the the big book is that we can start to condense this down into these kinds of much simpler expressions okay. I guess I'm just saying if you literally plug that into the EP over there you end up with um, the energy the so you're saying that that cancels what it get like energy equals the enthalpy of sublimation. Yeah. Uh, does that? Oh no, it does. Units work out because it's per mole. Yeah. Here. But I mean, I don't know that it's fair that we because if we do that then we're saying that the binding energy for one mole of atoms is the enthalpy of solvation or a sublimation which i guess is that's the definition the enthalpy of sublimation i wrote down is change one mole from solid state to gaseous state at standard temperature and pressure with units of kilojoules per mole would this be the whole coordination number because this is basically assuming that it's completely aligned as like yeah, I think you all, I mean, I think a better way to think, this, this would be a surface that's not broken. This would be a pristine surface, <laughs> right? Whereas this is a surface that has been broken. And if you put EB here, then this no longer, that, that no longer works. Yeah, that makes sense. That for this kind of pristine surface, Enthalpy of solvation, sublimation is the binding energy. But when you get into these systems where you have different number of broken bonds, then you have to look at it empirically. Okay. You don't seem convinced. Uh, I'm sure it will be over time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I hope so. <laughs> um, Okay, so then we could calculate, for example, the binding energy of, of gold. Um, when I do the math is for, well, again, it's important. So it's saying for FCC gold, face-centered cubic gold. Gold, FCC. I get 8.98 times 10 to the negative 23rd. What's the units here? I was going to write the final answer. So if I did th do that, do the, do the first line question, what do you get? Nope, no, we're calculating the I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is a misprint. This should be bond energy. This. So what's the units? 
there. Kilojoules? Per bond. Kilojoules per bond. Because up here we have kilojoules per mole, which we're given, negative 324 kilojoules per mole. Avogadro's number is atoms per mole. And then Z is bonds per atom. Yeah. So in the energy of bonding, it makes sense that you use a coordination number. But in the energy of binding, um, for your Z, let's say you're looking at a surface atom in a simple cubic system, you're going to have five closest neighbors, and you're only counting off for one on the edge. So would you use the value of five <coughs> the value of six? Here you would. Yeah. Why would you do that for the because the ones that have five are going to be so infinitesimally small relative to the entire surface. So is E sub B for the total system? Or it's, like the, the, it's a molar quantity. <laughs> um, so you're assuming, you're, yeah, you're, because it's so much bigger you're for an entire mole, you're considering that the number on the edge that only have five relative to six are very, very small. Okay. Right? So it depends on your surface area and the volume ratio. No, because it's a molar quantity that it doesn't essentially matter. Like it will matter if you get to smaller and smaller and smaller systems. Yeah, definitely. But for this kind of for these kind of <coughs> molar quantities, you can ignore those. Yeah. So if we were talking about something on the order of a very small quantum dot, then it might start being that. Totally. Okay. Yeah. And if you looked at in her example, she she goes through like gold. 13 cluster, gold 55 cluster, gold 155 cluster, and it's the energy starts to approximate bulk gold as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my question is, going back to my previous question, is, is do we ever use that equation really to find anything? Um, kind of, yeah. This one is much, this one is what we're going to use significantly that, that more. Sense, that one just yeah. It's kind of tautological, yeah. Wouldn't you have to say like how many you're actually coordinated with on a surface? Like as asking. How many you're actually coordinated? Like there's like the number of that it would be coordinated in bulk versus how many coordinated with on a surface. And so then you're. So surface coordination would be perhaps half if it's on a just a normal plane. If it's on the edge, maybe a quarter or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So then we can calculate this in units of kilojoules per bond. Okay. Um, so now what if we start to have different kinds of surfaces, right? What if we have these different kinds of planes? Right? Everyone shakes their heads. <laughs> Was it really that hard? I never learned this stuff as an undergraduate. And, um, and so I've had to teach myself Miller indices um, this quarter. I'm, li I'm literally like staying two lectures ahead of you guys. Um, so, but it makes sense, right, that these have different amounts of energy depending on how you cut these planes, right? In a crystalline solid, atomic arrangements are highly periodic and surface energy depends on bond energy and orientation of the surface plane. Values in tables for solids are averaged over all surfaces. So this is, I think, maybe what we're getting to here, is that these are even averaged over all surfaces. When you look up, like, for the bulk surface energy of gold in a table or silica, it's not going to say gold well, it may in a f fancy enough table, but um, it'll just say gold, silver, platinum. It's not going to list it out for these different surface, different types of surfaces, but it makes sense that those do have different energies. More precise surface energies are often necessary in nanomaterials, which often adopt highly oriented surfaces and facets. Yes. The nearest neighbor broken bond model considers the cohesive energy between nearest atoms in a lattice and allows surface energy calculations unique to specific planes in a crystalline solid. Okay? So 
let's just remember what we are talking about with these Miller indices, that it's just an alternative to saying the top or the bottom or the side of a plane, right? And so how you generally would look at these is translate your plane. Well, you can translate these planes. Trans I mean, if you hold the new plane parallel to any other plane, there is going to be no change, right? So could you just look at these right now? Do you know like what this one is right now? Just one, zero, zero. one, zero, zero. This one's one, 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 right? This, no, no, this one's what? Yeah, you're right. This one's one, one, one. <laughs> And this one is one, one, zero, yeah. right? Okay, if, that's, if you don't see that, um, watch this guy. I like this guy, um, and he's got several others. Um, as a ref this is like lecture 10, and then he's got a lecture 11, 12, 13 that, that walks you through that, okay? Um, so then what you can get when you have these different planes is what do the crystals look like on that plane, right? So this, these look radically different, even though here you're like, yeah, we're just drawing these different planes through a box, but they transverse the unit cells radically differently, right? And so a 100 plane versus a 111 versus a 110 look very different, okay? So then we can start to think about let's go over here this surface energy for any HKL is equal to the ES times this density HKL Okay, this is the atomic planar density. So that means number of atoms per meter squared or per nanometer squared. Okay? And that's the energy per surface atom. Okay, which can also be written as one half <coughs> number of bonds broken and EB we already defined as the binding energy per atom. And that's what we have over there. Okay, now this thing, this thing um, and this thing are kind of, kind of tricky. Could you, I, I couldn't, can you look at, let me pull up her thing. How many nearest neighbors are lost in each of these situations? So these are all, we're, we're going to make a 100 plane through three different types of crystals. So we are, somebody said earlier on, the, on a simple cubic, if we make a 100 plane, you lose one, right? Because you when you cut here, this nearest neighbor no longer exists, right? The one above it remains, the one here remains, the one there remains, and then the two on either side remain. So you have one broken bond, five nearest neighbors remaining, okay? What about body-centered cubic? Considering this <laughs> atom, because it's supposed to be shaded, I don't know if you can see it, how many, how many broken bonds are there? Four. It's four because if you look at it this way, I think it's a little bit more clear 
where if you're cutting through here, you've got one, two, three, four that are going to be lost. Okay. And it's also for for face centered cubic. But the the tricky thing too is then this becomes entirely different if you cut a different kind of plane. Right? Um, so maybe we can just do an example. Calculate the one zero zero surface energy for alpha iron or ferrite which adopts a body-centered crystal structure and has a lattice constant of alpha equals 2.86 angstroms. Okay, so we understand why we're going to need this enthalpy of salvation. Why do you think we need the lattice constant? Where's that going to go? Because there's some arcane way of using that. <laughs> <laughs> arcane. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're, you're right, is that we're going to use it to determine the... Um, atomic planar density, the number of atoms per meter squared. I don't think it, I mean, is it really that antiquated? Is it really that wrong? Okay, okay. Um, magic, good, I like magic. Um, okay, so what do we, if we can calculate this first, right? Our binding energy, that's a good thing to start with. So, two times <coughs> times Z, our coordination number. I said, we did say what? That it's body centered cubic, so that's eight. This is the, yeah, this is going to be our energy per bond. Kilojoules per bond. Okay, so now we have that. So now we need to calculate this packing factor. I think the best way is just to, well, we know what's going to be on our denominator, right? What's on the, the denominator is going to be, this is A squared, a squared right? This is atoms per meters squared. So that's going to be our 0.286 nanometers squared. Now what do you think's on the numerator? You just think about how many are, how many are contained inside that unit cell or inside that unit plane? Plane. Yes. Yep. And so you, if you look at it you'll find that there's four or there's one total in each unit plane. So then you Somebody all said it a, a better way. Well, not a better way, but how did you say it? Four quarters. Four quarters, which is one, yeah. right? And so if you look at it, do I have a different slice? Maybe not. I mean, maybe this is my best slice, right? So if, you, if this is your unit cell, right, you have a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, and a quarter. Okay? So four times one fourth. Right, equals one atom per 81.8 times 10 to the negative 21st meters squared. Yes. Because you're looking at the top, you're looking at the plane of one unit cell. And so this is one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. Maybe you can say it better. Um, you can also think about translating it towards the center where there is only one. And then you don't have to do four times one fourth, that's just one atom. 
So, if, so what he was saying there is imagine that you took this same square here and translated it deeper into the board. Then you would leave the space where you're intersecting these four and you would be intersecting perfectly that one in the next plane below it. That's what you're saying, right? Where are we getting one fourth from? You say each one is one fourth, but why one They add one fourth, like one fourth of the whole cell is, is participating in that unit cell. It's kind of like, it's how... Only one fourth of that atom. Isn't that going to be true no matter what? It'll always be one. We have eight atoms in the unit cell, so would it be eight times one eight? Well, the simple cubic, yes, it's eight times one. So here's a unit cell for a body-centered cubic. Yeah, this is totally specific to a, a it being body-centered, and two that it being um, a one zero zero plane. We're. I read and wrote. <laughs> um, let the. Um, no, this is absolutely. The it, it's. Um, so read her chapter and read um, also in the book. I'll, it's on this page right here. Oops. Well, the video is about the Miller indices. Also read there, 315 in the big book. Okay. Yeah, last year I last or this this time I, I I rubber stamped all of those crystallography exemption requests. But now that I here, I don't know that I'll do it next year. But yeah, so if we're pl we're translating through this plane, we have one atom. Okay, this is another slide deck. Do 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 do. Okay, so then we can start to solve all together. I think it's supposed to be a little gamma. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Did I miss something? So this is essentially <coughs> Okay, so this was our original equation, right? One half number of bonds broken. This is our energy of one bond and this is our density in this specific HKL system. Okay, which equals to me 3.5 joules per meter squared. Um, so, again, these, so the number, the planar atomic system here. Now this is different. This is two per a squared, whereas we just said one per a squared. But what's different about this table? It's about FCC, right? And so that's why this is a different, a different system. Our planar atomic densities are different, and the number of broken bonds can be different. But what they do in the book then is simplify this down and this would be a good homework expressionist or homework assignment is to show how these things, how to derive these different um, planar packing densities. So if we look at an FCC system, FCC 100. Zero, zero, if we are intersecting at a certain plane, that's why we can start to have these, these square roots, right? Like on a one, 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 zero, you have an um, isosceles triangle, and so you have that square root of two term. 
Okay. Um, so who cares? Um, <laughs> well, and how do we use this for nanoengineering? So um, you've probably seen these kinds of things, right? How gold, different shapes of gold have different resonances and they absorb light differently, right? So once you move to these longer aspect ratios, right? Aspect ratio is length to width we start to move deeper into the red absorption, right? What's interesting about these gold nanorods is that they have an absorption in both the longitude transverse and the longitudinal plane, okay? And so that's what we're seeing here where they all have kind of a peak around 500, right? That's their short axis absorption. And this is their long axis absorption, right? People generally tend to focus on here, but they do absorb right there, right? What you guys want a great project, you want to, to go, go into, like to get into MIT, is figure out a way when we have, when we have a batch of these things, right? We have all these orientations of our nanorods, right, in solution. <laughs> so when we're absorbing light through here, that's, this is the average of all of these. But what if we could figure out a way to make them all oriented the same way in solution? Yeah. Um, is it still going to be liquid and can I inject it into a mouse? So you're saying you want it to be, or you want it to be oriented in solution while they're inside of the mouse? <laughs> I mean, or even like how would you even do this like a liquid crystal uh, or a noble metal yeah um, how much area would that would that make like how much area how much with like is that going to orient like 10 nano rods or a mole of nano rods <laughs> Like the big Tesla coil, and like they all line up, and like, like Tesla coil. Very high. I mean, like, it's the same idea, right? It's like the same idea. Yeah. I mean, the be <laughs> the best example I've seen is where people will like make a magnet. Yeah, you just have a insert ferromagnetic. Yeah. That's the best example I've seen, and it, it still doesn't work very well. Um, so when you make these things, um, you use this surfactant called uh, CTAB. Cetal, meaning this is 13 carbons, tetra ammonium, or trimethyl ammonium bromide, CTAB, okay? And so this surfactant is supposed to be representing here on this nanoparticle, okay? Now, this, this synthesis had been around for quite a while, um, the turn of the last century, no, the turn of this century, until people really started understanding how it worked. So what you do is you start with this seed and then there's a growth step. So first you make your seeds and then you start to grow your particles. And so it turns out that the seed is actually kind of a, um, icosahedron. It has, it's not a perfect, it's not a sphere in any way, which kind of makes sense. These are, these are very small. And so we have different facets. And so the tips uh, tend to have a different planar orientation or different plane than the sides. And so therefore the sides have higher energy than the tips, okay? So they're, they're less energetically stable, okay? And so therefore the this surfactant, they have more affinity for this surfactant, okay? And therefore, this surfactant essentially is shielding the sides, leaving the tips exposed, okay? So here, this is a really nice TEM where they show this 110 plane on each side. Here's 111 and 001, okay? So the 110 is the less stable the most energetic, okay? Therefore, it has more affinity for CTAB. 
these have less seed fag and they can collect gold more easily, right? So this is um, a mechanism. And if we look at, where's my, if we look at the number of broken bonds for an F face centered cubic crystal, which is what gold is in this situation, the number of broken bonds for the 110 plane is five and then four and then three, okay? You're just gonna have to take my word on, me, on that for now. Um, and so the number of broken bonds then is highest here, followed by this, followed by that, right? So there are fewer broken bonds on the tips. Therefore, it has less affinity for the surfactant and has more opportunity to keep adding gold onto the end of it, okay? Does the surfactant kind of form like a, a bilayer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, you're, you make these in very concentrated CTAP, like 0.2 molar, 200 millimolar. It's really concentrated. So are you using that as a, like a capping agent on the side? So Not necessarily as a capping agent. You're, I mean, you're stabilizing it on the side, but then after you make these, you, you can centrifuge off that surfactant and replace it with polyethylene glycol or other stuff. Um, these are high, these are, these are, these are one of those things that always, in my hands, <laughs> I mean, or a lot of times in my hands, ended up looking like this at the bottom of the tube, right? <laughs> Just like, um, because they're, they're very, ener they're, they're energetic, right? These things flip out. And another, an example of that is, where's this? So here, a lot of what I do then is shine light on these particles, but it's very easy after you hit them with a little bit of light, for them to go from this spherical conformation and collapse back down into a sphere, right? Because think about the surface energy of this compared to this. Higher or lower? Lower, lower more energetically favored to move into the spherical coordination than this kind of rod-like conformation. Okay? Um, so this will, pro this will definitely be a homework question. Consider the gold nanorod to the right. So what are the energy differences between the, the, these different planes, okay? And so that part should be in per molar, right? You can just calculate that in kilojoules per mole, okay? Then I said calculate the absolute differences in energy in units of joules. So how would you do that using this data? Okay, so keep going. More than assume. We'd have to measure using that little two nanometer. Right? So, so th you would use this as your, well, it is a scale bar, and then you could start to go in and physically measure um, how much area and make some geometric assumptions about the meters squared that is 110, the meters squared that is 111, and the meters squared that is 001. Um, you can probably, why don't you assume for this that it looks like this? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a great homework question. <laughs> I love it. It's going to be a test question next year. <laughs> um, yeah, next year. Um, the question is, how, how accurate do we need to conform this? I mean, of course, everybody's going to get a different answer because when you go and measure this, it's going to be, you know, slightly different. So, okay. Um, so what else? Closing thoughts. The most, the most stable surfaces tend to be those that have the highest planar density, right? That kind of makes sense. I thought that was a great, a great quote from Andrea Taub. As this increases, you start to have more ener you start to have more energy, right? The most stable surfaces tend to be those that have the highest planar density. So this is just saying that nature abhors a vacuum, right? And so if you have more atoms there, it's going to be more stable, right? Um, the general trend is that 
uh, the energy trend is that 111 is less than 100, which is less than 110. 110 has the most broken bonds, it has the most energy, okay? Therefore, it is the least stable, okay? High index surfaces tend to be highly undercoordinated. So by high index surfaces, they mean things like 210, right? That's what high, higher <coughs> index surfaces mean. Relative, I mean, you could make these like 6, 1, 2, there's all sorts of different surfaces you could make, right? But generally, these are very undercoordinated and have higher surface energies. And crystalline particles tend to be low index, at least if they're going to be stable, where you can keep them around long enough to measure them. Okay. Um, so this, this was something else that I thought was important, that these high index surfaces, so when we do have situations like this, like imagine how you would start to, you know, look at a crystal plane and envision a 711 plane and figure out how many broken bonds you have. That's tough, right? So what she's saying here is that these high index surfaces can be considered to be a system of terraces and steps of these constituent low index planes. So here, this is kind of a cheat sheet for, if you had, you know, a 511 plane, you can think about it as three 100s and one 111. Okay. Actually, should that be a plus instead of multiply? Well, it doesn't add up. That'd be a four. Yeah, it doesn't no, it doesn't matter. I don't think it should add up. Because, um, no, because you're thinking about this plane being a system of these. So just because this, pla this, this complicated plane, like a 711, goes through a system of terraces and steps like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. What does this translate to as far as like, does this mean we literally... So if you did, go ahead, finish your question. Do three times the coordination number or something, or three times the number of bonds? Three times the number of broken <laughs> bonds, okay, right? So awesome. if you were trying to calculate how many broken bonds do I have in a 711 plane, you would have four times the number of, that you would for a 100. Then add the 111. And then the add the 111, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we'll see you back on Monday.